Hey, my name is Stephen Priest. And I'm Joel Priest. And guess what we're going to do today? What's neat this week? March episode starting right now! What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is What's Neat for March 2019. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we really do have a good show. First of all, we go out to Kansas City and take a look at Stephen Priest's and Joel's beautiful Santa Fe layout, an absolutely extravagant big layout. It's a treat this month to look at. Also, I show you the safety tips of using a sled for your table saw for making precise cuts with your models. It's a really, really neat thing that you should look at, and I'm going to show you how to do it this month. Plus, one thing we do look at is the new Bachman K4 locomotive. This is a streamlined Pensy locomotive. We built a new scene for it to shoot the 2019 cover. It's kind of a photography treat to look at this month. Also, I've got with me Michelle Kempema, who is starting a new segment for What's Neat for Model Road Hobbyist Magazine. And Michelle, tell us about that. Okay, so as the director of the Colorado Model Railroad Museum, I'm often traveling around the country working in tourism, wearing my tourism hat, and I decided to start filming the places that I'm visiting because a lot of times modelers are traveling and they want to do rail fanning on the way, so I'm going to start interviewing all the places that I go to and share with you all the places you can visit as you travel around America. So that's it for What's Neat in March, and we hope you enjoy. <laughs> For this segment of What's Neat, we're going to talk about this table saw. This is that wonderful four inch table saw that you can get from Micromark. It's great. I go through one of these about every 10 years because I use it so much. The purpose of a saw obviously like this is to get precision cuts. Those types of cuts that you can't get with a regular full size saw or a band saw or in any normal type of shop equipment. But at the same time, a hand saw still isn't going to be the answer to the project. So I love using these saws. The problem with saws like this is that you run the equipment, the stuff through them, they, they tend to be a little bit dangerous. Now they make saw guides, metal ones that allow you to run the equipment up one side of it, the wood and the shavings, and it works. But I prefer to use something called a sled. And what a sled is, it's a device that would hold your entire workpiece on a flat surface as you run the product through the saw. And I've built this one, in fact, out of plexiglass, which is a medium that a lot of professional model builders like to use for building buildings. For example, this structure, this grain elevator from uh, Greenville, Illinois, is built completely out of plexiglass as a superstructure because it's extremely strong and then you can laminate it with whatever type of modeling material your building's gonna look like. For example, here I've got some sidings here from uh, Holgate and Reynolds, and I've also got regular Campbell, uh, just beautiful metal, sheet metal work up and down this building, and it laminates very well on plexiglass. Another great thing that you can use plexiglass for, I like to take eighth inch plexiglass and make my tool holders. The screwdriver holder is going better on 17 years old and the stuff doesn't come apart. You glue it together with MEK and a paintbrush and it works really well. Now again, the point of this video was really to talk about this sled because this sled could be adapted to any type of table saw, flat surface saw that you use. Now I prefer to use it on this Microlux saw because it works really good with a four inch carbide bit when I'm also cutting the buildings. For example, as you run some of these design preservation buildings through the saw, the carbide tip blade is variable speed, so you can slow it down so you don't melt your plastic, but you can also cut an entire row of bricks straight throughout the structure, which is exactly what we want to do when we're building models like that. So it's something that I wanted to touch on. It's something that you could do if you've got a full-size eight-inch table saw or a small model building saw like what I've got here. Build yourself a sled. It's something that's helpful to run your material through when you're cutting it, it allows you to keep all your fingers safe. And that's this hobby model building tip for what's neat.
<laughs> for this segment of What's Neat, I'm doing an outdoor photo shoot today. It's about two degrees outside right now, but you don't feel it because there's really no wind out here at the moment, so it's actually working out. I'm shooting a tunnel diorama that I built oh, about eight years ago, and I'm featuring the Bachman K4 streamlining locomotive on this scene. It's an absolutely magnificent locomotive that I do want to show you guys. It is just something that Bachman has come out with recently new, and I've got to tell you what, the quality of this model is absolutely amazing as I zoom in here and try to show you what this thing looks like. It's got a uh, TCS wow sounds sound system in it so it's got the form of current keeper that keeps the locomotive running if it hits dead spots and the sound quality is absolutely fantastic. In fact these locomotives talk to you when you do the programming with them so it makes programming totally simple. It's something I wanted to share. This is going to put Bachman Industries out in Philadelphia on the map. This is truly a quality model that the modelers are really going to love and let me show show you how the 2019 catalog cover photo came out. It's kind of a cool shot. I've got trees on either side of the main line. It just screams, you know, farmland out in Pennsylvania. So what a beautiful shot here. Love doing it. The Bachman 2019 catalog cover photo is done. And I'm going to go back inside with my TCS uh, cup full of coffee here and uh, have a good afternoon. So with that, let's end this segment of What's Neat. For this segment of What's Neat, I'm in Parkville, Missouri, a suburb of Kansas City with Joel and Stephen Priest standing in this gorgeous empire. Now Stephen and Joel are both overachievers in our hobby. You can tell that based on what we're about to see on this layout. I do not over exaggerate when I say that. These guys are amazing. Stephen, you've been working on this layout for how many years? Tell me about this. Well, this particular road is six years. <clears throat> we bought the house six years ago. Uh, went ahead and you know did all the finishes, surface finishes and things like that in preparation for the railroad and then basically tore into the railroad itself. It took about six months to design, but from then we just it pretty much took off. Now you've got an eye for scenery. I can tell the way it flows. There's not a circus here and a city there without the flow between. Your scenery is weathered. Everything's laid out very prototypically. Um, tell me why is it you model that way? Well, I'm a, I'm a you know they're talking about model railroad, but I'm also a railroad modeler. And there's kind of a difference between the two of those. And it's oddly odd to say that, but it's really true. And so the idea behind here is we're actually modeling a railroad. We're actually taking 1978 and recreating it. So we don't have kind of a dog's breakfast of things. We don't have some steam engines over here and, you know, a European train here. It's, it has a very cohesive theme to it. And a lot of people don't model that way, but that's okay. You know, we happen to because I like, I like the, the feeling of an entire encompassing finished product. You definitely got this. Now I understand, Joel, you've helped a lot with the electronics. You kind of are a DCC wizard like our friend Daniel on the podcast. Tell me about your passion for the electronics. Well, it all started here when I uh, grew up with this layout. I started in 2012, so I was 12 years old. Um, just started working with building kits and working with JMRI and DCC and just really stuck with me and I enjoy it a lot. Um, another thing is my dad's getting older and he can't bend down as much so uh, my friend Cody Cameron and I uh, we are professional wire pullers so oh. my dad says we need to run this cable from here to there and I'm done in here about five minutes that's awesome you've got to be very very gosh what a great son yeah, to work on a layout with the family it's got to be about the family on this layout isn't it you guys work together along with Cynthia so it's a family affair plus you've got a lot of friends that you work with you want to give some credit to some of the folks that have helped you with this layout oh yeah man you know the, the cool thing is nobody's good at everything you know that nobody's good at everything so you've got these little 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 absences of skill sets and so you, if you can find people to fill those in then you really get that rare going so Keith Robinson and Dan Munson and Mike Porter and, and uh, Mike Dittmers and Jacob Dittmers and on and on and on I mean there's been about you know the average work session is 10 people but there have been as many as 19 people here and there's probably been as many as 30 people 
that have actually overall encompassing you that have come once or twice to help out. Craig Victor is one of those guys who comes over and lays track, likes track guy. So it's been a lot of fun and it's really, this layout is not just a testament to me and Joel and Cynthia, it's a testament to all the people that are involved, plus all the manufacturers that give us all this awesome stuff yeah. that, that's, that's basically our palette to paint with. Yes. Extended family. Yeah, that's our extended family. <laughs> yes, it's the best hobby in the world. I seem like I say that a lot, but it's about the people that I've run into in, the, in many years and all the things that I've learned like you guys are showing me tonight. I've learned some new things here, believe it or not, and I thought I knew it all. But just some of your ideas on how you stage things and your lighting and your LED lights that you've put in so many of these buildings around here. I mean, this is all new technology. You've got to actually be on top of it to know how to do that. I don't know how to do it. You do, and I learned how tonight. So I appreciate that. Now tell me, I want to ask you guys, what are some of your most favorite parts of this layout? And if you'll take us around and kind of point out some of the things that you're really proud of. Oh, sure. Well, I, I like the whole railroad. But you know there are keynotes. There are, there are keynote scenes that remind me of my railroading days, like the intermodal facility, and going down to Argentina and hopping on a on a consist of power. You know to go out and tire into your train and take off west across Kansas. You know at 70 miles an hour on a pig train. Wow. And so I created you know a large uh, intermodal facility and a large diesel facility, diesel shop, because that's the things I remember. And then of course the yard for switching. And I'm gonna I'm gonna segue into that just for a second. If you're an operator as a model railroader, oh. there's really two types of things that, that, that occur. There's uh, mainline trains that you run across the railroad and then there's switching jobs. And depending on the personality type of the people or what your day's been like, there are the times that, that people come home from work and they just want to relax and take a passenger car train across the railroad. They don't have to think, they just look at signals. But there are other times that same person will come over and he's like, man, I'm all raring to think. So we'll put him in the yard where he has to process and, and sort hundreds and hundreds of cars. The railroad is built to address both of those situations. So it's not one or the other, it, it encompasses both. So it's aesthetics and operation, and you're using the car card system. You've got it very carefully laid out. Everything's written out. It took a lot of time just to set that up, didn't it? It did, and Dan Munson did a lot of that. Dan Munson is uh, in, uh, works with the BNSF Railway. He's been in a lot of capacities. Currently, he's, he's yard mastering. And so that's what he does. He does TSPs, or train service plans, at Argentine, at Argentine Yard. Basically, he looks at his whole day and he plans out what his jobs are going to do. And so he comes down here and it's just an extension of that. He comes down here and he plans what the, jo the jobs are going to do on the railroad. So, and I think he actually enjoys it, which is the scariest part of all, yeah. The other thing you bring into operation is your CTC board, and you were showing me that. I'm running B-roll right now. You've got a window on there, so you can actually see out the window of the tower. Is that how it's supposed to be? Yeah, and, and here's the thing. A CTC panel, you can't have it in the middle of all the noise, because the dispatcher's got to think. He has to really program and plan out what's going on. But often, they get stuck back in a room and they don't have any attachment or any visual or physical feeling of what the railroad's doing. You know, they're, they're separated. So by putting that window in there, you know, he can turn around and look at the railroad and, and feel some type of a, of a relationship with the railroad as he's dispatching. And that's really important. I mean, it really keeps the demeanor of the dispatchers a lot more pleasant. Makes sense. Joel, you've worked on some of the buildings down here. I saw one of those really cool kits that you built. Tell us about your passion for some of that scenery work in buildings. So for scenery, uh, I really like working on the countryside because that's kind of where my dad first took me when uh, rail fanning out in western Kansas where he used to run around. So I like, uh, you know, including various plants, cattails and such in scenes. Um, but as for buildings, I like creating uh, kind of weird looking buildings or uh, something more industrial. Uh, I like cities a lot and uh, industries where you can switch with spurs and such. So loading docks is kind of my passion as well. That's amazing. And you are so dedicated, Stephen, in this hobby that so much that we're looking at today isn't going to be around in about three or four months. This is all <laughs> going to disappear, and you are going to build a new layout somewhere down in Kentucky in the south down there. You want to talk a little bit about your new adventure that you're about to start, and this video will be coming out in March, I believe. Well, we're always on an adventure in this household, I'll tell you, and we're not scared of things. Um, you know, change is good and if you, we want to continue to change all the way through our lives, continue to learn. Oddly enough, this is road number 16. We've had, you know, uh, many, many railroads, and so you continue to progress, you continue, continue to kind of perfect things. Um, Scaletrains.com, uh, I'm going to be working for them, doing their marketing uh, management and things. I've been involved in the model railroad industry, as you know, and a lot of people that are watching this know, and uh, they basically came to me and said, hey, you know, would you 
consider coming to work for us, you know? And I said, sure, you know, we'll, we'll look at it. And so we started talking and it worked out well. So we'll be moving down near Benton, Tennessee, which is just east of Chattanooga, between Chattanooga and Knoxville. And uh, originally they wanted me May 1, but they've moved that up to March 1 because they uh, just have a lot going on. So I'm really excited to go work with those guys. It's a fantastic group of guys and they are pioneering and they're hiring the people to stay pioneering. That's the cool thing, watching their, their plan you know, they're hiring the people that are on the cutting edge of model rare earnings. So, yes, the rare is coming down, but there'll be another one. It's just a thing. Man, you're an amazing spirit in this hobby. You're a valuable asset to them. I wish you the best of luck with that. I guess you're looking forward to moving to a new place, a new environment. Well, yes, I'm looking forward to moving, but I'm not going to be moving with them. Um, okay. I'll be joining the Air Force uh, enlisted this fall, so who knows where I'll end up. Wow. Awesome. Dude, well, we're going to walk around and look at some of your more favorite parts of the layout, but I really appreciate you both taking the time to share this with us. So let's go check out some of your cool stuff. Let's do it. Rolling. Joe, we're standing at the east end of Robinson, and I see this beautiful little area with the double track main line. Now, this area is one of your favorite parts of the layout. Tell us why. Well, when I was really young, um, we went out and celebrated Dina Day in North America, which is Railroads Illustrated. Um, go out and take pictures across the nation um, kind of holiday. And we went out to this place in Bosworth, Missouri, uh, very, very rural. And there is a place just like this scene here. And we tried to recreate it on this layout because it's just such a cool area. In fact, um, these little bridge uh, supports here or prevents the erosion, we actually modeled that from that area as well as long as the bridge. and. Uh, Tried to model my friend Cody and I here rail fanning as well. Um, other than that, I also like how the scenery just came together with the uh, telephone lines and the signal placement and uh, the signal maintainer down there as well. So, This is amazing. You did a great job on this part of the layout. Well, thank you. So Steven, we're standing here in one of your more favorite locations that you've described, and we're going to look at a few of them here. Tell us about this area here that we're looking at. Well, this area is called Centralia, and I love it for several reasons. First of all, it's right in the middle of the railroad, and it's a really small compact yard, but it's a very busy yard. It's where the Santa Fe branch line breaks off, uh, which is about a third of the railroad is branch line, non-signal branch line. A lot of the guys like to go out and carry on and switch on the branch line during a session. It's also where the Rock Island comes in and gets on trackage rights to go towards St. Louis. So uh, the combination of those two things make it extremely busy uh, and also extremely scenic. And one of the things that I that I like about it is a number of years back I worked with uh, Athern uh, to do this this depot kit. I worked with uh, George Riley there when George Riley was at Athern. And uh, that structure, um, they, were, they made them out of uh, basically uh, casting. And um, you see them around on railroads, but it's kind of neat to look at that and know that, and realize I, I designed that. And it was uh, the Marion Depot, which was my childhood home. And I remember going down and watching the Santa Fe locals come in to Marion and uh, sat there at the depot. And even when it was raining, I'd sit underneath the eaves of the depot and stay dry. And so that depot has a lot of meaning to me. So that's basically one of the reasons I love this area. Hey Ken, one of the things I want to talk to you about, because you know I like unique things in modeling, because uniqueness sets your model road apart. This structure right here was bought for me by a good friend of mine, Steve Hoddle, who's a locomotive engineer for the BNSF. He found it on the internet that they would custom build any bridge that you wanted. And so what he did is he went out and he ordered this bridge off of plans we had, and basically around 400 bucks, they delivered it from the Orient. So eBay has other interesting things that you can do as well. So it's a, it's a very unique structure, and the coolest thing about it is it will not allow you to run uh, high cube cars through it. Um, it's kind of that back New England clearance type of thing. So it's really neat. So this is, acts as kind of a choker restricting factor for our branch line. It won't allow high cube cars. So that's one of the things that in Centralia, you kind of have to switch those cars out. So it's one of my favorite things about the railroad is that. And right beyond that is this little junction where the Rock Island crosses the Santa Fe. And that's a neat area to run too. And one of the things that's cool about it is the signals all function here, but the signals run, on, run off this panel here that's actually built right in to the area. So the operators, just like the prototype railroad, they actually go out and they line their trains themselves through the junction, through the interlocking, which is quite prototypical because the branch is not signaled, but the interlocking has to be. <clears throat> so that's one of my favorite things as well. So what we've got here is we have an interlocking, which means two roads are crossing. So just like an intersection, a highway intersection, we have signals that protect that so the trains don't run into each other. It's run off the panel up here, which you saw earlier. 
but I have a freight car here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to roll it into what we call the plant, and you'll see that signal drop when the, uh, when the freight car enters the, uh, the plant. And that's done basically to protect trains to keep them from colliding. So this is kind of a, an island in here, a little signal island, um, which all over Western Kansas or where anytime railroads cross, this is what they did. They'd create what's called an interlocking plant and they'd interlock it so only one train could go through the interlocking at a time. Hey Ken, uh, one other thing I want to show you about the railroad is I'm not a big fan of Helix. Coming out of the engineering department of the Santa Fe Railway, Helixes combine two of the worst forces in railroads, grade and curvature. And on the prototype railroads, whenever they have curvature, they lessen the grade. Unfortunately, helixes kind of challenge us in the model railroad world. There are other ways to go between decks. What we've done here is, if you notice, this is a constant grade. We have about a 40-foot grade that is a 1.2% grade, which all it does is provide us the ability to go between levels on the railroad. So um, basically, instead of a train disappearing into helix for five or six minutes, it goes into a tunnel, comes out the other end on the grade, and we're set. So this train here, just a couple seconds ago, was in the upper deck, or the upper level. And here it is down below. I also like fuel pads. This is one of the things I've never seen modeled on uh, uh, Model Railroad before. Mike Brusky at Dimensional Model Concepts actually makes all these uh, fuel booms and oil booms and water booms, which are really, really nice models. And I thank Mike for doing that. He's an awesome modeler. Hey Ken, another thing I really loved, like I mentioned earlier, that I used to love going to work and climbing up on engines at the Argentine engine facility where there were, often there were 200 or 300 locomotives there. Obviously we can't do that in model railroad form, but I can get a good 50 of them into my engine facility. So I patterned this kind of after what went on at Argentine, which is a lot of fun. So we build consists here, we fuel, sand the locomotives, and then we have a shop, uh, which will be located here where they actually will repair things. Uh, a good friend of mine, Steve Hoddle, bought both of these Overland sanding towers for me off eBay. He found them. He had been looking for them for years, and they came available within about six months of each other. The only thing we did to modify them is we added lighting to them. We added these bush lights to them, which makes them look really awesome, especially in, in evening scenes, because the ones at Argentina, of course, were illuminated. So, uh, With DCC, it's a lot of fun to build consists here, and you'll notice here we've got car cards and waybills and things for all the locomotives. Every locomotive has a card, so we'll actually build the, build the consist during an operating session. It's an absolute blast. Hey, Ken, come on in, let me show you something. You know, it's interesting, a lot of people believe that model railroading happens all at the layout, you know, bench work and trackling, and in truth, a lot of it does. But one of the keys to having a good model railroad and being a successful model railroader is creating a good shop. In other words, a good place to work, a place that you can sit down, build models, leave for a while, go up, have supper, come back down, continue working on the model. It's keynote. Also, <clears throat> organization. All these drawers full of parts. It's absolutely an essential to being able to, to build good models. And so half of the shop is actually just storage of materials to build things out of. Then of course the other half of the shop is work areas. And this shop is divided into actual four areas, so four people can work here at once, or you can work on different types of projects. So right here obviously is a paint booth where we paint. We have an area here that we do milling with our machine shop so we can do DCC installs and things like that. We have a general kit build area which is kind of this center aisle here. And then in here around the corner is a little electronic build where we do all our DCC installation, uh, do a lot of the, the installing of lights and things for structures and things like that. And of course, all the programming for DCC as well. So it's an extremely keynote to build a good shop if you want to be a good modeler. Uh, you just absolutely cannot separate the two of those. They're, they're entrenched with each other. <laughs> Steve and Cynthia, I want to thank both of you for the hospitality of having the What's Neat folks look at this beautiful empire. This is going to be the closing on this layout, the end of an era as you move and go on to build something else just as a magnificent, but I got to tell you what, in a way it's kind of sad because there's so much love and passion that I see work in this layout. You guys want to close out this one for us and kind of... Sure. Well, I want to say, you know, the neat thing about model railroading is there's always something around the corner. You know, you can look at this and say, oh my gosh, you spent all the time doing this. Oh, it's the end of the world. The sky is falling. But really, you know what the thing is? It's a great opportunity. I have a whole new basement to design, you know, and there's going to be things I'm going to do differently. I'm going to uh, probably do all incandescent lighting so I can dim it. All kinds of things like that. It's a great opportunity. That's awesome. Cynthia, say something. Add to this. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? 
Um, if you stay still for too long, you miss out on life's adventures. And that's what I consider being married to him is one continuous adventure after another. That's awesome, guys. You guys make this the best hobby in the world. High five. <laughs> and that's this segment of What's Neat. Hi, this is Michelle Kempema, and I am here with Jamie Johnson from the Historic Rail Park and Museum. Did I get the name right? Exactly. It's Historic Rail Park and Train Museum. And train, I forgot the word train <laughs> of all things. Train, right? The most important <laughs> part. It's so exciting to meet another woman director of a rail attraction. Yeah. It's really fun to meet you, and I've enjoyed your museum today. Can you tell me a little bit of, about your museum? Sure. So the actual train depot that we're standing in was originally built in 1925, and about 20 years ago, they actually came back to restore the entire building, and then the museum was put into place um, about 12 years ago. So we just celebrated our 11 year anniversary. Okay. And we're really excited to be here to have two stories of a museum. 
That's wonderful. You tell all kinds of stories in here. I thought it was really interesting that when we came into the museum, this is the part of the museum that was segregated, and you really do tell that story of rail history, and you have your Jim Crow car outside, and that's just a really neat story that you tell. And tell us about the railroad, that this beautiful train here that we got to walk through and see the rail cars. Tell me about that project. Yeah, so, you know, when people visit us here, our, our mission is to tell the story of passenger travel. So we're not about freight travel. We don't have open stock that anybody can just walk in to everything um, is protected and so we have five restored rail cars that we take guided tours out on and so when we bring people into those cars we're actually able to show them a, a true glimpse into what it was like in the golden era of train travel and you know to get these cars here was a huge undertaking we have a total of eight cars just five on the tour but each car came in different you know some came by rail and were hoisted onto our track some actually came in on semi trucks and then again were hoisted onto the track some of them came in the condition, um, like our, our towering pine, which is a sleeper car. It came in pristine condition. Um, literally the last day that they unloaded passengers, they closed the door, never reopened it again until we got it on site. So it was just a matter of cleaning it up and opening it up. Now, some of the cars, you mentioned our Jim Crow car, that was actually once a deer stand out in the middle of the woods. It's not even, it wouldn't have even been recognizable. Somebody thought, I think that used to be a train. Um, you know, so we brought it in and and we've spent a tremendous amount of money and a lot of time working on that car and it's still not ready to be bid on the tour um, but you know each car tells a different story and each car it means something different to us and so you know like we have a, an original uh, post office car you don't see a lot of those and you definitely don't see a lot of those restored and so they, it's taken a lot of volunteer hours to make those things happen a lot of um, people that are just passionate about about travel and passionate about history so yeah there's there's a lot of stories going on around here good stories <laughs> I the mail car was my favorite that's just a beautiful car and you've restored it beautifully it's just a really neat thing and of course you tell the story of only the mail car dog in there and I just really enjoyed that. So tell us about your big project that you're working on right now. Yeah, so like I mentioned, you know, the museum is, we were coming on our 12 year anniversary and so we've created a Save the Depot campaign. And you know, we've got this beautiful building. I mean, our building alone is worth about $4 million and we are a nonprofit organization. So, you know, you have to think, how does a nonprofit organization maintain a building like that? Um, you know, we, we have several hundred thousand dollars invested into our train cars. And so we look for people to come do tours. Um, we rent out our facility space for weddings and all kinds of things. We have event, special events here that families can come to. We have an event coming up called Romance at the Rail Park where we offer people a, a, you know, an, an evening on the dining car to eat. So we do all these things to generate funds to keep our doors open. And so you know, now in our 12th year, we're seeing that you know, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for not only our train museum but other train museums out there. And so we created the Save the Depot campaign um, as really a nod to the 1940s and World War II and and we're using the propaganda posters to put the word out that we need the community to pull together and and support this place and become a member attend an event you know any of those things that help us and part of that theme actually came from a new exhibit that that is has been designed and we are currently fundraising for and hope to put into production this year uh, but we have an exhibit called railroads go to war and and one of the bigger pieces of that is world war ii you know things like rosie the riveter all that kind of stuff is what you're going to see with it and so that's really where the theme of Save the Depot came from, but the the whole point of it is to truly save the depot and keep this place open um, because we don't want to lose a gem like this in this community. It's, it's very important to us. I agree. I think it's a beautiful place and you've done a great job. I mean, your exhibits are first class. This is just a beautiful museum and there is a model railroad here and I took a lot of footage of it. Can you tell us a little bit about the club that you have here? Yeah, so we have a group called the Show Modular Model Railroad Club. They are a group of volunteers and so basically what we do with them is they get the space and uh, we allow them to utilize that space and they maintain the exhibit. And then what they get from us is all the travelers who get to come through, get to see their exhibit because you know, a lot of people will have a model train display in their basement or in their garage, someplace that nobody ever sees it. And so this is an opportunity for them to actually showcase their passion, their hobby, all of their hard work. And we have so many people that come through here and look at that model train and they're just, they're impressed and they're inspired. Um, and then they go home and they start building something. Um, so, you know, it, it's just great to have that here. And then, you know, the different members of that club who are dedicated to the, even preserving that 
particular exhibit because for us it is an exhibit you know they're in here day after day putting in hours and hours and hours to maintain um, the buildings that you will see on there um, the the little trees all those things you know you have to there's maintenance on those things <laughs> yeah. definitely the tracks and the cars I mean I come in and and um, it, it's always fun to see what the guys are up to but a lot of times they'll have the bands on with the little light and they're down there you know like they're doing surgery oh, on yeah. a car and so um, <laughs> you know it, but it's really cool because it, and these are people who are um, you know they're just really cool people they're engineers um, there, there are people that, you know, we've got one of the guys, he, he used to own an HVA seed company. And so they come from all these different backgrounds, um, but they're all joined together by, by their passion and their love for railroading. Um, and some of them, you know, actually worked in the railroads, you know, at some point. So it's just really fun to see all of them come together and, and, and maintain that, certainly that important piece of our museum. I think that's fantastic. And, uh, on the show that we have called What's Neat this week, we really like to talk about how that's the greatest hobby in the world because it's about passion and you totally talked about that. It's about passionate people coming from all walks of life and building model railroads because it brings us joy. And why don't you tell us your website right off the bat? Sure. It's historicrailpark.com. And what is the main railroad that went through here? It's the Louisville and Nashville line. Yeah, I think that's really neat. I honestly didn't know much about it and I learned a whole lot today and it's very cool. And I even got to go inside the locomotive. It was very exciting for me. It's the best hobby in the world. Thank you so much for being with us today and talking to us. Thank you for visiting. Come back and see us. And for those of you that model the Louisville and Nashville, this is your home. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado, or order online at mycaboose.com.